Osteonecrosis, also defined as a vascular necrosis or a septic necrosis, is characterized as a bone cell death that follows an impairment of blood flow to the bone from a traumatic or non-traumatic origin. Osteo means bone and necrosis means death. Around 1830, and I might butcher this name, Jean Cruvelhaya, a French anatomist and pathologist, described necrosis of the femoral head as a late complication of hip trauma. He presumed vascular injury from trauma was the etiology, only etiology of the necrosis. However, in the early and middle 20th century, various non-traumatic factors were identified to induce the disease or are involved in the development of osteonecrosis, including alcohol and steroid use. Osteonecrosis most often happens in the hip joint, the femoral head, but may also occur in other anatomical locations, such as the shoulders, the knees, and the ankles. In this video, we will most focus on the hip necrosis, osteonecrosis. So, the anatomy of the hip. The hip is a ball and socket joint. The socket is formed by the acetabulum, which is the part of the large pelvis bone. The ball is the femoral head, which is the upper end of the femur. The surface of the ball and socket is covered with articular cartilage, a smooth, slippery substance that protects the bone and enables them to glide easily across each other. The pathophysiology of osteonecrosis is not completely understood, but most theories point towards a disruption or compromised blood flow as the initiation of bone death. And this disruption could occur from a traumatic or non-traumatic cause. So let's look at each of these, beginning with traumatic cause of bone death. Traumatic cause of bone death you can think of as a direct loss or occlusion of arterial flow to the bone, leading to ischemia. And the causes include a femoral neck fracture or dislocation. And these injuries cause really damage to the blood vessel that supply the femoral head, which can lead to osteonecrosis, bone cell death. Radiation injury and a rare condition called Kaysen disease or decompression syndrome in scuba diving. What happens here is that when one goes scuba diving, it can cause formation of nitrogen bubbles that can occlude arterioles, leading to osteonecrosis. Non-traumatic causes of osteonecrosis usually affects adults younger than 50 years old. The causes include, or risks include, steroids, either endogenous or exogenous. Significant alcohol use. Gaucher's disease, which is a marrow replacing disease. What happens here is that a type of fat, a type of lipid called glucocerebroside, cannot be adequately degraded and can lead to direct obstruction of blood flow, essentially. Sickle cell disease. In this condition, red blood cell undergo sickling and can then cause a direct obstruction of blood flow and bone marrow hyperplasia. And this will lead to, essentially, uh, osteonecrosis. Any hypercoagulable state can lead to thrombosis formation, which can occlude the artery and blood flow. Systemic lupus erythematosus and transplant patient are also at increased risk. Importantly, though, the non-traumatic causes are also impacted by genetic predisposition. Because quite interestingly, you know, some people who use a lot of steroids and alcohol don't get this condition, osteonecrosis, while others do. And so there's thought to be a genetic play involved. Genetic factors are also implicated in hypercoagulability states and hypofibrinolysis. Now, those traumatic and atraumatic causes of osteonecrosis could be the same for 
any joint or bone, including the shoulder, the femoral head, the knee, or ankles. However, we are going to focus on the hip joint and the femoral head. Now, in regards to classification of the osteonecrosis of the hip, the FICAT and RLET classification was the earliest and yet remains the most widely utilized classification. It uses plain radiographs, MRI, and clinical features to place osteonecrosis into these stages, essentially pre-collapse stage of the femoral head, stage 1 and 2, and post-collapse stage of the femoral head, 3 and 4. In stage 1, looks quite normal minor osteopenia. In stage 2, you have sclerotic lesions and subchondral cysts possibly. In stage 3, you lose that round appearance of the femoral head. And in stage 4, you lose the roundness of the femoral head, but also you start losing the roundness of the acetabulum, and you develop significant painful secondary osteoarthritis which leads to the clinical presentation of osteonecrosis of the femoral head. In the early disease, this is pre-collapse. In the early disease, the hip can be painful and typically is the first symptom. It could be dull, ache, or throbbing pain in the groin or the buttock. There can be difficulty standing, but more so weight bearing, so using weight on the affected side. Moving the hip joint can also be slightly painful. Early on, the hip joint has actually relatively good range of motion, and this is because only the femoral head is involved in the early stages of disease. In the late stage of the disease, this is termed post-collapse. In the late stages, it may take you know, several months to years for the disease to progress. But later, as the surface of the femoral head collapses, the entire joint becomes significantly arthritic. Hip and groin pain with activity is very common, and later the pain also is present at rest. There is reduced range of motion and stiffness. Investigations for osteonecrosis include an MRI, which is the gold standard in detecting early osteonecrosis and is able to differentiate from other differential diagnoses, such as bone bruising. Here is an MRI of an obvious right osteonecrosis of the femoral head with some collapse, but also this patient actually has left-sided osteonecrosis as well, so bilateral. Diagnosis can also be made with plain radiographs and x-ray, but this is typically in moderate to late disease. Now, here is an x-ray of a right femoral head, and here you can appreciate there's collapse of the femoral head. This is definitely at least stage 3, and most likely it is stage 4, because the acetabulum is already roughened. Treatment for osteonecrosis of the hip. There is non-surgical treatment, which really involves lifestyle changes. You'd have to be using crutches, for example, or walking aids. And then there's analgesia for pain. There is a role for bisphosphonates as well for osteonecrosis. However, there is not great evidence for bisphosphonates. And funnily enough, bisphosphonates can also lead to osteonecrosis, mainly of the jaw. The definitive treatment is really surgery, and in early disease, hip preservation surgery is used. Things to do include core decompression, where drilling one large hole or several smaller holes into the femoral head is done to relieve pressure in the bone and create channels for new blood vessels to nourish the affected areas of the hip. There's surgery called vascularized fibular graft. Here, a segment of bone is taken from the small bone in the leg, typically the fibula, along with its blood supply. This graft is then transplanted 
into a hole created in the femoral neck and the head. And the artery and the vein are reattached to help heal the area of osteonecrosis. In the late disease stage, so stage 3 and 4, in the classification we learned, with severe osteoarthritis or loss of function, a total hip replacement is required. So in summary, osteonecrosis is defined as really bone cell death that follows impairment of blood flow to the bone itself. And this could be either through a traumatic or atraumatic cause. We mainly focused on the femoral head, the hip joint osteonecrosis, but really all the causes we have learned and treatment relatively the same amongst all the joints that suffer from osteonecrosis. Thank you for watching.